In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance Family Conversation. And as always, it's great to be with you in the middle of this month of May, which is the month of Mary. So let's uh, start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary has many wonderful titles. Mary is the mother of God. <clears throat> Mary is the mother of the church. Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. So let's invite Mary to be with us by praying the prayer that she loves most, and that prayer is the Hail Mary, also known as the Angelic Salutation. So let's uh, lift up our hearts, our minds to Mary, who's also on the Hail Holy Queen. We invoke Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now let's lift our gaze to our spiritual director. Our spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has many wonderful titles. Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. Holy Spirit is also known as the Gift of Gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as the Sweet Guest of the Soul. Holy Spirit is also known as our Consoler. Our consoler as well as our counselor. Holy Spirit is also our interior master. St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, chapter 8, that we really don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans, so we can say Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's... Uh, invite the Holy Spirit to be with us to give us a lot of light in our intellect as well as the fire of divine love to burn within the very depths of our hearts. As we pray. The classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit. Thou shalt be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice 
in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, <clears throat> world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Francis Xavier, pray for us. St. John Paul II, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. How true it is, my friends, a family that prays together, stays together, and a world at prayer is a world at peace. A world at prayer is a world at peace. So after praying with you, I Thomas said, I'll pray for, for you. I'll place all of you on the altar right now in the greatest of all prayers. And the greatest of all prayers is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. There is no greater prayer in the world than the holy sacrifice of the Mass. It is the prayer par excellence. So I'd like to place all of you on the altar. And offer the following intentions. First, I'd like to pray for all of us as we draw closer to Pentecost Sunday, this Sunday. that we would be open, that we would be open to the inner workings of the Holy Spirit. In our lives. Perhaps this can be our prayer. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention will be that all of us would pray for our families, for the conversion of our families, the sanctification of our families, and for the salvation of our families and family members. Our Lord has said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And my last intention, as always, will be I'd like to pray for those who will be dying sometime today will be passing from this life to the next to be judged by our Lord. If we know neither the day nor the hour <clears throat> that God will call us. 
pray for those who are dying and let's pray for ourselves that we will be granted the grace of all graces. The grace of all graces is to die in the state of grace. Grace of all graces would be to die in the state of grace. So my friends, In just a few days, we'll be celebrating the feast day of Pentecost, which is the descent of the Holy Spirit upon all of us. Let's open our hearts to the downpouring of the Holy Spirit. Praying often, come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. So let's pray that we would be really open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Our wisdom, knowledge, understanding, they perfect our intellect. Counsel that connects our intellect to our will. And then fortitude, piety, and fear of the Lord. Let's pray that we would be truly open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our lives. All right, my friends, I made reference to this yesterday. We're going through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And last week we were speaking about vows and promises. So today we'll enter into another dimension and it concept in it is the social duty of religion and the right to religious freedom so before going through this uh, very important number which is two one two one oh four in the catechism of the catholic church I would like to just make a general overview of this. Every country has to allow the freedom to practice religion. Therefore, any regime that oppresses the ability to seek God and to practice religion freedom freely is doing something diametrically opposed to God as well as the church. For that reason, we have John Paul II was one of the greatest men who ever lived. And he fought bravely as Archbishop Cardinal, and then as Holy Father for religious freedom. 
and he made huge stri huge strides. One of the reasons why was the following. Pope John Paul II was born in Poland in the year 1920. In May of 1920. He lived in a time in which two different countries entered into his country trying to prevent the Polish people of their right to religious freedom. So there's anyone that really understood this and John Paul II was instrumental in the writing of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. He knew it, not simply theoretically, but he knew it personally and practically. Because what happened was the Nazis invaded Warsaw, Poland, at the start of the Second World War. Then once the Nazis left, then the communist Russians entered. trying to suppress the practice of religion. So I repeat, if there was anyone who understood the right to religious freedom and how, how much he suffered under that intolerance, that oppressive political milieu, it was John Paul II as, as uh, Archbishop and even as Holy Father. So I'd like to uh, I'd like to go through one of the numbers of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's number two thousand one hundred and four, and the title is "The Social Duty of Religion and the Right to Religious Freedom." All men are bound to seek the truth, especially what concerns God and His Church, and to embrace it and hold on to it as they come to know it. This duty derives from the very dignity of the human person. It does not contradict a sincere respect for different religions, which frequently reflect a ray of truth which enlightens all men. Nor the requirement of charity which urges Christians to treat with love, prudence, and patience those who are in error or ignorance with regard to the faith. That's 2,104. And Sophie's actually posted the number for us from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> so three brief comments on that. Governments have, governments have no right to suppress the right to religious freedom. And 
we just have to be very honest. Communist religions, they suppress, they suppress the individual person's right to pursue his searching for the truth and searching for God. Second is that we have a we have an obligation in our lives to keep searching for the truth. Now, thanks be to God that all of us in our perseverance family we have discovered the truth in Christ because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Thanks be to God that not because of any merit of our own that we were endowed, most of us, with baptism even when we were very small. Then also, with respect to other religions, with respect to other religions, We should respect them. We should respect other religions. However, this does not mean that we should not We should not refrain from a real missionary impulse in our in our lives. What I'm saying is this we should respect other religions, true. But still, Jesus said, Go out to all nations teaching them all that I taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. So we respect other religions, but at the same time, We should not be afraid to teach the truth, preach the truth, enlighten the minds of those who are living in darkness. Then pray that they would open their hearts to the fullness of the truth. And the fullness of the truth, my friends, is found in the Catholic Church. So that's our number in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Our social duty, our religion, and the right to religious freedom. Religious freedom. Okay, my friends, we, we have a few days left before we arrive at Pentecost. Technically, in two days in the night, Saturday, we already enter into the vigil, the vigil mass for Pentecost, which is very beautiful. Pentecost is the birthday of the church and it is the descent of the Holy Spirit upon Mary and the Apostles. So over the past 50 days, thanks be to God,
we've been going through the book, The Acts of the Apostles. So we've arrived at Acts chapter 22. St. Paul has great courage in preaching the fullness of the truth. So Paul is thrown in jail. So he's brought before the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin. And this is what's going to happen. It's a very interesting passage. And you're going to be seeing in the New Testament, the Gospels, as well as the Acts of the Apostles, the appearance of the Jewish people but they had different theological viewpoints. Specifically, the two groups that we meet today in the Acts of the Apostles. And they would be the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So then the Sanhedrin, the legal body of the Jews, Paul is brought to defend himself against the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Even though there were two religious Jewish groups, they had, they were diametrically opposed in some of the essential doctrines <clears throat> among which are three that we'll encounter today. Paul lifts his, his voice and he says boldly that he is a Pharisee of Pharisees and the son of Pharisees. Because Saul is, Paul is from Tarsus. Now he's going to say something that is going to cause a great conflict discussion debate fight among these two great among these two groups he says that i am a pharisee of pharisees then so to speak he throws the rock at the hornet's nest He says he believes in he believes in the resurrection of the dead and he believes in spirits and he believes in angels. Now, upon hearing this, the Pharisees say, let him go, he's done no evil. But the Sadducees are infuriated against what Paul says because they don't believe in any of those three. They don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They don't believe in spirits, and they don't believe in angels. So, the quarrel becomes so heated that the commander was afraid that Paul was going to be torn in pieces. So they ordered the troops to go down and rescue Paul from their midst. 
and take him into the compound. One thing that's very admirable is that St. Paul is not so much interested in pleasing people, but St. Paul is interested in pleasing God. The wonder of at times, the Curie of ours says that one of the biggest problems once we are converted, we start to practice our faith, is what is called human respect. Human respect means very often we act guided by the purpose of wanting to, being, wanting to be liked by people. That's right, wanting to be liked by people. It's called human respect, wanting to be liked by people. I put it this way, and perhaps Sophie can write this down. Either we are, we or either we are, people pleasers or God pleasers. Either we are people pleasers or God pleasers. We have to choose. St. Paul definitely was not a people pleaser, but he was a God pleaser. We should always ask ourselves, is this pleasing to God? Is this what God wants? One of the best stories I ever heard on trying to overcome human respect, showing how if we only try to please people, it's not going to work. It's the story of the father, the son, and the donkey. Father, the son, the donkey, they're walking through a town. The town's people laugh at them saying, well, they're, why don't they use the donkey to travel? So they go to the next town and the boy sits on the donkey. The townspeople say, what a bad boy that is. He's sitting on the donkey. He should, have, he should respect his father. He should get off the donkey and let his father sit on the donkey so that he can ride it. So they go to the next town and the father gets on the donkey. The people say, look at that little, look at that man. His son, he's got small legs, he's sweating. Boy, he does not really care for his son at all. So they go to the next town. And the next town had an animals' rights society. Probably know that there are towns that have animals' rights society. So both the son and the father sat on the donkey <clears throat> as they traveled through this next town that had an animal's rights society. So they walked in front of the animal rights society. And they came out of that building and started to criticize the man and his son. That poor donkey, that poor beast of burden, he's suffering so much, he's gonna have a heart attack. 
they should get off that poor donkey and not oppress him by their weight. So the next town, the father and the son, they put the donkey on their shoulders. And they had to cross over, they had to cross over a bridge to go from one town to the next. And they slipped on the bridge, they slipped off the bridge, and the man plunged, plunged headlong into the water, so did the son, and the donkey followed them. And the three of them, the father, the son, the donkey, they drowned in the water beneath the bridge. It's a funny story. It is. It's a comical, funny story, but it's a good one. Because this story tells us very clearly that we can't please everyone. We can't please everyone. We have to try to be God pleasers. We can't please everyone. We have to try to be God pleasers. And it is, it's a kind of a funny story, but there's a real truth in it. That's why we admire St. Paul because he was courageous enough to always be preaching the truth. We admire the martyrs because they're courageous to always be preaching the truth. We admire the martyrs, for example, that of St. John the Baptist. He told King Herod that he was doing something wrong. He was living with his brother, brother's wife, he was living in an incestuous relationship. It was wrong. John the Baptist was beheaded. The same thing happened with St. Thomas More. Thomas More had to choose between God and the king. And Thomas More chose God. Even our young friend Jose Luis Sanchez del Rio, he had to choose between the federal government and Christ the King. And Jose Lito said, Que viva Cristo Rey. Que viva Cristo Rey. Que viva la Virgen de Guadalupe. That should be us. We should always be asking ourselves, is this pleasing to God? And we should discern that if it is we should carry it out in the last verse today we find Paul in the compound and the Lord speaks to Paul Paul is a universal preacher and he's going to be going where God wants him to go. And sacred scripture says, take courage. 
For just as you have borne witness to my cause in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness in Rome. So we're going to be seeing Paul traveling now to the eternal city of Rome where he will testify to Jesus Christ in the eternal city of Rome. He'll be incarcerated. And that calls to mind the movie St. Paul <clears throat> that I mentioned earlier, which Jim Caviezel is acting as St. Luke, and he's visiting St. Paul in the Mamertine prison in Rome, where Paul has visitors. And he's preaching the word of God to the prisoners. And eventually, during the persecution of Nero, which the city was set on fire, Nero blamed the Christians as the scapegoats. St. Peter will be crucified upside down. St. Paul will not be crucified because St. Paul is a Roman citizen. And the Roman citizens did not have to die the cruel death of, the, of crucifixion. So St. Paul will, will be eventually <clears throat> beheaded. He'll be decapitated. True what Mary Jo says, the saints give us great courage. They give us great courage. The responsorial psalm, the antiphon is, keep me safe, O God, you are my hope. Keep me safe, O oh God, you are my hope. Our help is the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. If God is with us, who can be against us? For those who love God, all things work together for the good. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing I shall want. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. You will have persecution. But be of courage. I have conquered the world. When I'm weak, then I am strong. All things are possible for God. The Lord is my rock, my bulwark, in my fortress. So I've just quoted 10 different verses that are related to our hope and trust that we should deposit in God. And isn't it really that the message of St. Faustine and the diary, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. I don't trust in myself, far from it, but Jesus, I trust in you. Then I'd like to take, move from there to the gospel.
which is taken from the, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 17, verse 20. which it says, referring to Jesus, lifting, lifting up his eyes to heaven. Let us get in the habit, my friends, to meditate upon that verse. Jesus lifting up his eyes to heaven. Lifting up his eyes to heaven. That very much refers, my friends, to what we celebrated last Sunday. And that is the feast day of the ascension of our Lord into heaven. That's right, the ascension of our Lord into heaven precedes Pentecost Sunday. It's a day in which we, contemp we contemplated Jesus there on Mount Olives, giving his last instructions to the apostles. Go out to all nations, Teach them all I taught you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus gives us these very consoling words. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end of time. But these words, Jesus lifting his eyes to heaven. Those few words say so much. My friends, let us think, meditate more upon our eternal destiny. We are here in this world a short time. Seventy is the span of man, eighty for the most robust, as the psalm points out. Span of life is 70, 80 for those who are most robust. But my friends, we should never <coughs> forget never forget, my friends, that the primary purpose of our life is to get to heaven. Jesus actually says this. I'm going now to prepare a place for you so that where I am you also may be. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not tell you. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the mind of man the wonderful things that God has prepared for those who love him. So my friends and Perseverance family, share this message with your friends. All of you, think more about heaven. And all of you have a very special place. All of you have a very special place right now reserved for you in heaven. 
So let's pray for each other that we'd be patient and recognize that heaven is our eternal destiny and we have a place prepared for us there. Let's do all we possibly can to make it to heaven and to bring as many people to heaven as possible. And I will give you, my friends, my priestly blessing. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.